My guest today is Jeremy Miller. Jeremy, how are you? Good, well, David. How about you today? I'm doing great. Tell me, what do you do for a living? So, um, <clears throat> I founded my own software company last last year, Jasper FX Software. Congratulations! Uh, is, thank you. I don't know if congratulations is the right word. Um, it's ostensibly and long term to create a business model around a suite of open source um, software tools. Uh, but we are also wide open as just a run-of-the-mill consulting company, helping clients with uh, modernization products, projects, architecture, test automation, the normal stuff. <clears throat> Very cool. Um, and we were talking at, at Code Match last week in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, you had seen one of the interviews I recorded about a month ago. Uh, Steve Smith was talking about clean architecture, and you've got some issues with clean architecture that I want to hear about. Are you, so I'm not, well, that, uh, I'm going to be – tell, tell me that. All right. So I'm going to be contrarian, but, but what we're trying <laughs> to do is uh, – not not trying to bash on Steve or even technically the clean Steve's architecture. Steve's a great person. I love Steve. <laughs> Steve's a great guy. Um, that's partially a lie. We're totally going to bag away at, at the clean architecture. Um People use the clean architecture or the onion architecture, any of these prescriptive hexagonal architectures as a set of infallible rules um, of uh, one like size that, fits all rule set. Yes. So the word prescriptive, that's what I'm criticizing. That is where I think people go very, very wrong with these these approaches. Um, define, so I, define prescriptive. So by prescriptive, I'm saying – Hey, you know, you, Mr. or Mrs. New Developer, follow this project template exactly. Every use case, what I want you to do is um, you're going to build these exact five things for every use case. Right? So what happens is people pick up one of these clean architecture, onion architecture um, <clears throat> project templates, and you automatically have four or five projects. So... <clears throat> and you have a prescription usually based around the nouns in the system, the entities, you know. So if you're building an invoice system, you have an invoice controller that talks to an invoice service that's in a different project that may talk to an invoice repository that's in a third project. And they may be working on DTOs that are in a fourth or fifth project. Um, and this noun-based organization, um, there's, there's a couple problems that hit you right off the bat. It's automatically too complicated for a small system. Um, that's that's a problem. It okay. scatters closely related code all over your solution. To understand any web service in your system or any message, you're having to drill through a little bit of code in one project, then another project, the third project, and maybe even a fourth. So very closely mm. related code is scattered all over your code base, but you also have to mentally tag it, I'm looking at this little piece of code inside of this one giant controller. Um, mm. So that's one issue. Um, another issue is people think mostly about organization in terms of horizontal layers. <clears throat> yeah. We get in a situation where every feature in the entire system is built in these big layers. Now, when it comes time five years from now, when it's time to modernize your system, you want to switch databases. You want to upgrade from in Hibernate to the latest EF Core. That's come up with a lot of clients lately. And you can't. Yes, you've got a layered architecture. You've got repositories. But if your project is built in these really broad layers, you, have to, you may have to upgrade the entire layer at a time, and it's just too big. You can't do it. You cannot. I, I, no, I mean, I thought the whole idea of using something like a, a – uh, MD framework is to abstract that away so you didn't have to update uh, other layers. That's a theory. That is definitely a theory. So I think if you had good test coverage, you could, here, here's an example. I think you could migrate from SQL Server to Postgres, which are very similar behaving databases. And a few mm -hmm. people do that for cost. Right. You're very, it's very unlikely you're going to move from one relational database to another relational database. Sure. You're going to want to move to, hey, we need we could find a huge jump if we could move from SQL Server as a relational database to Cosmos or DynamoDB or yeah, a, a you know, my Martin uh, project. No, yeah. no SQL database. Yeah. 
or um, you know, the database might be a bad bad term, or you know, maybe there's some other library in your system you would like to replace, but replacing it means you have to change that out in every single <clears throat> single handler inside of one of these horizontal layers. In which case, mm. you just can't practically do it, or not. It's going to be probably be too hurtful to do it in an incremental way that you can convince your project managers, your product owners to let you do it. Yeah, I have a, I will say I've had this experience. Just adding a column to a table in a database often requires modifying multiple layers because that column has to be passed up through the stack. Yeah. So there used to be a <clears throat> ages ago. I worked with some folks that had a phrase for that. They call it the wormhole anti-pattern. <laughs> um, if you add a new database column, how many step repetitive steps do you have to make until it can yeah. show up on the screen? Yeah, and they're trivial steps, but boy, they just—they're just grunt work. You just—they take time, which the ORM was supposed to <laughs> solve that problem. They do. But going back to going back to the prescriptive problem, you know, so you may not buy into what I'm saying about the horizontal layers being too much of a problem, but it will be over time. Um, you know, another problem is saying I'm always going to follow this pattern no matter what. And what you find is some use cases, it's it's unnecessary. You'll find service layers that do nothing but delegate down to a data access layer. Um, in that case, you built unnecessary complexity, and that's annoying. Um, a bigger problem is you say your prescription says you have a method in an invoice controller, you have a method in invoice service. But that one particular use case may be really big and really complicated. Um, by this kind of noun-based, noun-centric way of organizing code, it doesn't lead people to um, factor their code beyond the prescription. They stop thinking about maybe this should be pulled out into a helper method. Maybe this is an entire mm -hmm. concept that doesn't that would help us make better code, better testable code here, but it's not defined in the prescriptive architectural approach. I, I guess. To, to sum that up, what I'm, I'm saying is the, the prescriptive approach like that, you know, the, the hard loop to find rules, it turns people's brains off. It, it stops people from mm -hmm. innovating, from thinking, from deviating from these prescriptions when the prescriptions are very unsuitable or, in, <clears throat> or just not up to the task of what they're actually doing. Right. Interesting. Um... And you said you said at the beginning that uh, it doesn't work well on small projects. Talk talk a little about that. Well, I think it's overkill for small projects. Um, you know, so we're we're all old enough to remember you know, like five years ago when microservices were super hyped up. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, yeah. When, well, back when I was young, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're definitely in the trough of disillusionment cycle with <laughs> microservices. So we'll see what the future holds. But something that happened to folks is. One of the advantages of microservice is if it is so small, <clears throat> looks like it's silly, but if it's small, maybe you can get by by doing purely integration tests. And if I can do integration tests, I can make a much simpler coding structure. I don't have to think so much about separating things out, having scenes, and getting mock objects in, and all that good stuff. If it's easy to do an integration test in the end with a small microservice, I can write simple code. Um, on the other hand, people still following the prescriptions, and I saw this happen a lot of times. They're tasked with building a microservice, you know, and it's it's maybe like two or three controllers, maybe 12 endpoints all told, but they still build out, you know, a project for the controller layer, a project for the service layer. Maybe they throw a mediator in the middle, so you get all the extra mediator handlers, and they still have a repository project, and you still have and base classes everywhere, and I entity base class, and I, you know, just I service something layer super type, and you end up building a whole lot of baggage that may be justified in a big project, but it's severe overkill on small projects. And when teams did this, it totally removed any benefit you might have gotten from a microservice approach that might have allowed you to just write much simpler code. Yeah, I think that's a problem with a lot of patterns and frameworks and uh, tooling is that they they do add a level of complexity. And so you need to justify that complexity. They have to have, have an advantage to that. So a small project, you can't, it's hard to justify adding the complexity of microservices or layered architecture. 
when you could just whip it out in a day, especially something that's really not going to be used broadly. Yes. And so, so what I would tell teams um, is to, you know, if, if we kind of go back the other way around, you know, okay, smart guy, what, what is good, right? Um, <laughs> you told, you stole my question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So because because we are of a of a similar age, you know, and when I do my slide deck for this, I have Conan, what is best in life? I, um, I, I, so, oh, was, uh, to destroy your enemies and uh, hear the wailing uh, of their women. Yes. <laughs> it's good kid stuff. Um, <laughs> what is good, I think, you know, is I want teams focus on having very good test automation support. You know, if you have to introduce layering to get to your test automation, then the layering is valuable. But having ah. really good, having really so, good test automation support, regardless, it will make your architecture reversible, such that you can introduce that layering later. That makes it easier to refactor if you change your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, I, so your goal, one of your primary goals, is make write testable code, because Absolutely. testable code is more maintainable code. So regardless of what architecture or patterns or philosophy you buy into, that's always top of your mind. It is. And maybe some of parts of the clean architecture, uh, ports and adapters, probably another broader term. Some of that was originally meant to help with testable architecture. Maybe it can yeah. help. But um, and then, then there's another half of it. You know, the world is different now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, when we first got into unit testing heavy, it was all about creating abstractions and interfaces so you have seams to mock. Um, a lot of today's technologies, a lot of today's databases, as an example, if I have a database engine that's easy to spin up in Docker and tear down on the fly, if I have a database engine where it's easy for me to wipe out the, the state of the data between tests, I can do a much more effective integration testing than I could 10 years ago. And if I can, if I purposely choose technologies that are easy to use for, and reliable to use for integration testing, I can eschew some of the more complicated clean architecture type approaches. That that's that's one of my theories about how to do this. Um, yeah, I like that idea. Uh, the whole idea behind mocking was because databases were hard to spin up and tear down and recreate and produce. They just they were time consuming. They were difficult. They resource intensive and unit tests should be fast. You should be able to run yes. them, you yes. know, make a change, run your unit tests, uh, see the results, make another change, fail fast. And I'm not, absolutely. And I'm not saying mock objects are, are evil, but they're definitely overused. So, okay. And, and then another thing, so the clean architecture, you know, people fall into this. Let's, let's do these huge horizontal tunnels, horizontal layers. Let's organize by nouns in these. So let's, let's make two big changes. Um, you know, one, let's make sure that we have some loose coupling between logical modules within our system mm -hmm. anywhere we can, whether that drives you to a modular monolith. And to be honest, I have some, I'm dubious about whether that actually works out for us. You break things up into services, whatever you do, but it's very beneficial if you can create a circumstance where even modules within a closely related system, if you can upgrade one module at a time, that's much more efficient to be able to modernize over time, whether I don't want to have to modernize the entire data layer at a time. That's one thing. Right. The second thing, um, you can keep your logical layers, but still move to kind of a vertical slice architecture where code is very closely related. And this time, let's organize kind of around the actions in the system, the logical commands or events whether this takes you to CQRS or what, but organize more around use cases in the system, such that code that is very closely related to each other, the web access code that calls business logic that is then persisted, put all that code that's very closely related in the exact same place. Put it as close together as you can so that you can be working, you can be narrowly focused on one area of the code and not be bouncing all around your code base. I, th I, I think, think you're talking about uh, slicing your application up vertically rather than horizontally. Is that right? Yes. And, and, you know, what it really comes down to is you organize your code vertically first and then horizontally within that vertical slice. Okay. Right? So people get worried that, well, if we're not doing clean architecture, it's going to be chaos. And, and that's not a binary choice. Ah, okay. 
you need to figure out whether it's going to add the value to that particular project. Mm -hmm. that, because that's the, now that you have your own consulting company, you have to know the universal consulting response, the UCR to everything is, it depends. Yes. <laughs> just, just folks, folks, if you're going to spout, it depends. Just make sure it's dot, 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 and then you continue with what does it depend on? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, this conversation we're having about vertical sliced architecture reminds me of another conversation on the, I had in this show with our mutual friend, Jimmy Bogard, who actually developed the, a framework. And I think you mentioned it earlier, the mediator, mediator framework, mm -hmm. which is designed to facilitate that. Are you using that approach and those tools, that tool in your projects? So no, but um, well, okay. So the vertical slice architecture, that, that's Jimmy's terminology, but I think it's a great, it's a great description for what, what we're trying to do here. Um, that, that in a, um, <clears throat> philosophical, yes. Um, so one of my open source tools called Wolverine um, could be used, a subset of what Wolverine does could be an alternative to Mediator. Um, the value of Mediator, and I don't wanna get in trouble here, make anybody upset. The value of Mediator is MVC controllers, MVC core controllers. Um, you have a predominantly .NET audience, or is that unfair? Uh, I try not to. I try to be as broad as possible. Okay. Well, um, so I'm sure I would guess Spring Boot has the same problem. But the controllers inside of MVC core and .NET world, they have a tendency to become very bloated. The mm -hmm. prescriptive architectures... You know, again, invoice controller, and you end up with 15, 20 HP methods, and they can all be big methods. So it becomes a hugely bloated class. I'm, I'm sure Spring Brood is vulnerable to this, too. Um, <clears throat> not that you have to do it that way, but just there, there's things in the framework that just kind of lead people naturally to fall into that pattern. So what Mediator does that I, I think is valuable, and I, I didn't probably understand this at first is Mediator allows you to offload the actual processing to more of a command handling kind of scenario where you take in, you take in a message through your, your controller and immediately hand off to an in-memory command processor of, here, go handle this. Whatever it does, who knows? But that forces developers to start building more focused code, having a handler that handles one type of message. So it, it gets them out of having these big, massive classes to something that's much more focused, like I want to be anyway. So Jimmy's, Jimmy Bogart's Mediator is a tool that helps people working in a typical .NET stack kind of view closer to that kind of vertical slice architecture that I think is more advantageous. Um, okay. And you, and you have a framework as well. You mentioned it, the Wolverine uh... mm -hmm. Uh, I'm looking at the GitHub page right now. I didn't realize this was yours. This is awesome. Tell me yeah. a little about that. So, um, so Wolverine's been around. The project itself is brand new, but it's descended and it's been renamed several times. So it goes back about 10, 12 years. Um, it is ostensibly it is a message handling system. Um, so it is made for asynchronous messaging or being a mediator tool where you can just invoke commands, messages in line. Um, it also has um, an element of asynchronous processing through just local queues, running commands. Um, and then it has, uh, you know, the fourth thing is it has an add-on. It has its own HTTP endpoint layer. So the Wolverine HTTP endpoint could be used as an equivalent or replacement for MVC core plus mediator. So okay. Wolverine is very optimized for um, the single, single, um, the vertical slice architecture type approach. Got it. Okay, so the early, really early in the conversation today, you said mediator, and you were talking about mediator, the open source framework. You were talking about mediator pattern. I know, I know. It's 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 his fault for for using. He spells it different. Yeah. Remember, yeah. So he, there he, is. He disemvoweled it as one does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So mediator the pattern, where it's just I have a controller and our, our something kind of input, and then I basically have a facade that I'm going to say execute this command, and the mediator will find the right handler for you and build up all the repositories, whatever it takes to handle this command. But all you have to know is drop it off at this one point, and it'll handle it for you. Oh, nice. Okay. 
Um, we're getting close to time. What uh, is there anything we haven't covered that we should have? Um, I mean, just a little super very generic advice for anybody who is a technical leader in your in your shop or, or wants to be. Um, just remember, you know, the evil bad words here. Clean architecture is not the dirty word. Uh, the dirty word is prescriptive. Um, okay. Yeah. You cannot just hand off a list of here is some black and white rules. You have to follow this. You can't do that. You got to send up kind of more of a decision tree. You have to explain why am I why am I making this recommendation to you? And always leave your the people who are listening to you that you are leading. Try to help them understand why are you doing this and when does this advice not apply so that they know when there's an escape hatch to forget what I told you before because it does not apply in this this very different scenario. That, that that's like the best advice I could give anybody who wants to be a technical leader. Totally agree. I, though I've phrased this as there's almost no dogma in software development. Software development is always dynamic and you always have to make decisions on where you are. There's, there's that, that silver bullet that we're all looking for. It just doesn't exist. Oh, that, that's very well put. I mean, co constant adaptation, constantly listening to, is this really working or not? You know, and remember that that architectural approaches that you pick up early, everything works early on and your system may change over time. And yeah. the stuff that worked great three years ago might be the absolute worst, might not be the best way to go about it in the future. Awesome. Well, this has been a really interesting conversation, a lot of good food for thought. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your ideas. Thanks for having me on, David. And it was great catching up with you last week, two weeks ago, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. <laughs> it is, man. You stay, you stay safe. Will do. You too, man. You know how, how that you've heard that saying all your life, the cobbler's children have no, no shoes? <laughs> For me, you know, my friends are always trying to recommend some technology or another, whether it's Nest or, or you know, something to automate your home. <laughs> like... I don't want to do that. I do enough technology during my work day. <laughs>